Good. Can everyone see my slide? Is everyone there? Everyone yeah. is good. Let's go. Okay. Good. Good. Thanks. And uh, well, sorry for the, uh, for the issue with connection. I hope there will not be. Normally, the connection is stable, so I'm supposed to stay here. So, as I was going, as I was about to say, first, thank you all for being here. Um, well, especially because this is uh, an unexpected Zoom talk. It was supposed to be an in-person talk, and now it's on Zoom due to COVID circumstances. So, well, thanks for being here, especially because, as you know, Zoom talks are always, um, well, they're virtual, they're, they're a bit awkward because everyone is behind their screen. So please, you know, I always emphasize this for my talks, but here especially, please do feel free to interrupt at any time if something is unclear, if you have any question, just go ahead and ask because it's a pleasure to discuss. So, and also the talk is timed so that we have ample time for questions this, within the one hour of the talk, so it's fine. So as announced, and again, thanks Mark for, for setting all this up. So uh, as announced, I'm going to talk about very phases that appear when one deforms a quantum hole droplet in a, in a certain, in certain manners. Uh, this is based on work in progress with Benoist, which uh, we are actually hoping to put online very soon, hopefully maybe even in 2021, but of course this is always a bit random. So, so let's see, in any case, soon on the archive, it should appear. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. Now, um, I'm actually going to start by introducing the subject in a very broad manner, meaning that I'm going to first uh, motivate the question that I'm going to consider in such a way that I even motivate my research in the last five years or so. So the broad motivation comes from the fact that diffeomorphisms, that is smooth deformations of various continuous media, uh, diffeomorphisms are ubiquitous in physics. So for example, in general relativity, they provide the crucial gauge redundancy of the theory. In hydrodynamics, you can think of fluid flows as time-dependent diffeomorphisms. And uh, finally, in condensed matter physics, of course, you're always free to deform your sample in whichever way you like. Uh, and this is especially striking in topological phases of matter where there's a notion of robustness against deformations, which is of course crucial. So in all those cases, there is a notion of, well, diffeomorphisms play an important role. And so it's natural to ask if um, there exist certain observables associated with the geometry of a group of diffeomorphisms. By this, I mean that you can think of a group of diffeomorphisms as an infinite dimensional manifold, which may carry a metric, a curvature, maybe a symplectic form, maybe some holonomies. And uh, you may be able to compute some of these geometric objects and see that these objects have observable consequences uh, in the real world. So from an aesthetic perspective, if you will, what drives me is the fact that uh, there is an underlying infinite dimensional geometry to certain physical setups, in fact, to many of them. And this infinite dimensional geometry has certain observable consequences in our very much finite dimensional world. And so that goal, the goal of finding infinite dimensional geometric observables is the broad motivation for today's talk. Now, more specifically, uh, the talk today is going to be about the quantum hole effect, where uh, the important role of diffeomorphisms has been known for a very long time. Indeed, ever since the 80s, we call the quantum hole effect was found in 1980. So shortly after the discovery of the effect itself, it was realized that uh, Lando levels provide a sort of illustration of non-commutative space. And in that context, it's crucial to understand the deformations of the sample that actually preserve this non-commutative structure. More specifically, they preserve the symplectic form on this space. And those deformations are, in fact, area-preserving diffeomorphisms. Now, it turns out that area-preserving diffeomorphisms will, will play uh, a key role throughout today's talk. So I'm going to uh, use a sort of shorter name for them, just to save some syllables. I'm going to call them zdiffeos, where the prefix s stands for special, in the same sense as in the special linear group of a vector space, which preserves its, its volume form. So today's talk is going to be about Zdiffeos acting on the quantum hole effect. And in that context, one, uh, well, really notable example of the action of Zdiffeos on the quantum hole effect is known as, as hole viscosity. I'm going to return to this very soon. But perhaps more broadly, uh, the entire sort of approach of today's talk fits in one general line of research known as the geometry of the quantum hole effect whose purpose is quite generally to study responses of quantum hole samples to various geometric perturbations, be they perturbations of the metric or the potential or really deformations of the sample. 
Now, specifically, what I want to argue is that when you take a quantum hole droplet and you apply to it certain adiabatic diffos, the droplet generally picks up a berry phase. So what I mean by this is that you should really think of the setup I consider as a sort of droplet, such as this disk here. And you should imagine, imagine this disk as being filled by electrons. So there's sort of a density, a roughly uniform density of electrons in the bulk. Then there's an edge. So I have a droplet in the plane in front of me, and I'm going to deform that droplet in a certain time-dependent manner. So typically, what you should have in mind is this kind of time-dependent deformation. So I deform it, and you know, I give it a certain shape, and I return to, to the shape it, it initially had. As, as I do this, the many-body wave function of the system picks up a certain berry phase, and you might hope to actually be able to compute that berry phase. So those are the berry phases that I'm actually going to talk about. Now, if you're a bit familiar with the literature on the quantum hole effect, you may recognize that this is very similar to what is normally called as hole viscosity. In the context of hole viscosity, what you do is that you put a quantum hole sample on the torus, and you deform the torus linearly in a certain way, and you read off the associated uh, Berry curvature. So it's very much similar to what, what I'm going to talk about today, but there are actually two key differences which I really want to emphasize and which we're going to see uh, have a role throughout the talk. The first key difference is that whole viscosity is normally computed for linear diffos, while I, by contrast, am going to consider completely general, arbitrary, nonlinear deformations. So in fact, parameter space here is going to be very much infinite dimensional, where, whereas by, by contrast, in the context of whole viscosity, parameter space is, by construction, finite dimensional. And secondly, uh, whole viscosity is normally computed for samples that have no edge. Specifically, again, you take a torus, which has no boundary, and you just fill the torus with electrons in such a way that a certain number of Landau levels is completely filled, are completely filled, sorry. Now, that's not what I'm going to do. What I'm going to do instead is to consider a finite droplet, a droplet with finite area on a plane. I'm not actually going to talk about the torus at all. And I'm actually going to deform that plane in a certain way. And we will see that because of that, because the droplet is finite, there is an edge. And that edge turns out to contribute to the berry phase. In fact, it's going to contribute dramatically in the sense that it's really the edge contribution that, that is eventually going to reproduce whole viscosity. So in that sense, whole viscosity is normally computed as a bulk observable, while, while what I'm going to argue is that you can think of it as an edge observable. So in that sense, you can think of what I'm going to talk about as a sort of bulk edge correspondence for whole viscosity. I'm really rederiving whole viscosity from the edge, but I'm also generalizing it greatly. As you will see, there's many more things I can do here than what you normally do with whole viscosity. And so that really is uh, the goal of today's talk. And so with this motivation in mind, here is now the plan. Um, there will be four rough sections. In the first one, I'm going to remind you about berry phases and actually compute in front of you berry phases due to deformations of a one-dimensional sample. That would be sort of a toy model that motivates the rest. Then in the second section, I'm going to um, well, define an, a unitary action of diffos on wave functions in a plane. This is sort of a preliminary for section three, where I'm actually going to deduce berry phases associated with these unitary diffos. And finally, in section four, I'm going to compare uh, what I've done so far to the notion of whole viscosity, and in particular show that whole viscosity is, in a sense, a special case of uh, what I've done. And so that's the talk. Uh, again, let me stress that if you have any question, please do feel free to interrupt at any time. I'm more than happy to have questions and discussions, and it's much nicer to you know, have interactions than to talk in front of my screen, seeing no one into the silence. Okay, so if everything is good so far, let me uh, start immediately with section one, where I'm going to talk about um, adiabatic diffos in one dimension, giving rise to certain very phases. And so to do this, I'm going to proceed in two steps. First, I'm going to remind you what berry phases are in the first place, just so we're all on the same page. And then I'm going to argue that I can compute certain deformational berry phases in one dimension. So to introduce berry phases, suppose that you consider a quantum mechanical system whose Hamiltonian depends on a certain set of continuous external parameters. Here, I'm collectively denoting these parameters by the letter G, because I want you to think of them as being labeled by a point in a group manifold. But at this stage, you should just think of this as a convenient shorthand notation for the full set of parameters of continuous parameters of the system. Now, since the Hamiltonian is parameter dependent, so is its spectrum. 
Here I'm focusing on one particular eigenstate of the Hamiltonian at some point G in parameter space. And I'm going to assume that this guy has isolated and non-degenerate energy. So it's separated by a gap from any other uh, eigenstate of the Hamilton. And then the question we're going to ask is, what happens if you say you are an experimenter, you come up to the system, and you start tuning the dials of the system in a time-dependent manner? So you really change parameters in such a way that you're now following a certain path, gt, where t is time, in parameter space. The question is, can you then solve the corresponding time-dependent Schrodinger equation? In general, you don't know how to do this, but if you assume that you're varying the parameters very, very slowly, then in fact, the adiabatic theorem ensures that if you start from an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, you remain in an eigenstate uh, at all later times. And if furthermore, you perform the variation cyclically so that you start from some point in parameter space and return to that same point eventually, then in fact, the final wave function coincides with the initial one up to a phase factor. And the phase factor happens to be the expression written here. As you can see, this is the sum of two terms. The first is an integral of energy known as the dynamical phase. And the second is the term we're interested in, that's the very phase. In particular, notice that the very phase explicitly stems from the parameter dependence of energy eigenstates. Now, if you're familiar a little bit with very phases, there's one example, which is sort of the, the simplest textbook example of very phases that you may have heard of. Namely, imagine that you have a spin. So actually this time I, I don't have any drawings here. I'm actually showing things with my fingers. So maybe you should look at the camera. Imagine that you have a spin vector put in a very strong magnetic field. And suppose that, so, you know, if the magnetic field is very strong, the spin is going to align itself with the magnetic field. And if you now start changing the orientation of the magnetic field very slowly, the spin vector is going to follow it. And if eventually you return to the initial orientation, the actual state vector of the system has picked up a Berry phase, which happens to be proportional to the area enclosed by that path on unit sphere. Now, it turns out that this particular example, a Berry phase of spin, is only one uh, specific instance of a much more general Berry phase, which exists due to any unitary group action that does not commute to the Hamiltonian. And so, in fact, what I'm going to talk about today is precisely such unitary group actions, except they're going to be specifically given by, by certain uh, sample diffeomorphisms acting on certain samples. So for this section, for now, I'm going to talk about one-dimensional samples. Spe specifically, I'm going to focus on a quantum mechanical system on a circle, so that the wave I have a certain particle on a circle described by some two-pi periodic wave function, and I want to act on that wave function with deformations. Now, you can think of these deformations as functions g of phi, but it is much you know, intuitively much clearer and much less abstract not to think in terms of functions, but in terms of actual deformations of a circle. So here is a circle where I have distributed a bunch of points. And what I'm going to do now is to act on this circle with certain diffeomorphisms just to give you a flavor of the kinds of deformations I have in mind. So here's the first example, where, as you can see, I have pinched the circle here on the right and expanded the points here on the left so that I have reduced the density of points on the left and increased it on the right and thereby, in a sense, deform my circle. Of course, the circle is still mapped on itself. I haven't actually turned the circle into an ellipse or anything. I'm really performing a bijection of a circle, but I'm doing it in a way that changes the local density. That's the typical diffeomorphism that you should keep in mind in one dimension. And of course, you can do anything you like as long as it's smooth. So here's another example where I have decided to pinch the circle at three points instead of one, and so on. You can do anything you like as long as it's smooth. In particular, of course, you can rotate your circle freely. Notice that rotations are especially simple to write in terms of functions. You can, run them, you can write them in this way. And in particular, this sort of gives you the intuition for what kinds of functions these guys are. You can think of them really as any such diffeomorphism is essentially a rotation plus some two pi periodic function that you can add here on the right. That's really how you can think of diffeomorphisms. Now, what I wish to do is to act with diffeomorphisms on wave functions, meaning that for every diffeomorphism G, I want to define a unitary operator U of G acting on wave functions. Now, to define this action, I actually have to tell you what's the value of this transformed wave function at some point phi on the circle. By definition, I take that action to be given by the right-hand side. You can immediately verify from this formula that this is, in fact, a unitary action. You can verify that this genuinely preserves scalar products of wave functions. But you can also verify that this is actually a representation of the group of diffeomorphisms. By this, I mean that the unitary operator implementing the composition of two diffeomorphisms is just the composition of their respective unitary operators. 
So that's the kind of transformation I have in mind. In particular, in what follows, you will see that these inverse diffeomorphisms are going to appear repeatedly. So I'm going to adopt a simplified notation for them. Instead of writing the inverse of G as G to the minus one, I'm just going to write G bar. That's just to save some space on slides and to make the formulas a little less heavy. Crucially, I can now address the question that I actually set out to address. So I can choose some uh, adiabatic family of time-dependent deformations of the circle. I can suppose that I'm acting with those guys on some eigenstates of the Hamiltonian and ask what is the resulting Berry phase. Specifically, I'm going to assume that the eigenstate is actually a plane wave with some angular momentum j. And then the Berry phase is given by the same formula that I wrote on the previous slide, except I'm now applying this formula to the case where parameter dependence comes from a unitary group action. So I have, I, here I have unitary operators acting on these wave functions. Now, these unitary operators are written here, and the scalar product of wave functions is just an integral over the circle, so you can really compute this. And what you end up finding is this very simple expression for the one-dimensional deformational Berry phase. Now, there are two aspects of this formula that I really wish to stress. The first is that the angular momentum j enters, so that was a parameter specifying uh, the eigenstate that I'm considering, but it's now also a parameter that actually gives determines part of the value of factor of the Berry phase. That's the first comment. And the second comment, which is perhaps even more important, is that parameter space here is manifestly infinite dimensional. I very much have an infinite dimensional parameter space of all possible deformations of a one dimensional circle. And still, despite this, the Berry phase is a fairly explicit function of this path where, oh, by the way, I should have mentioned this, G dot, of course, is the time derivative of G and G prime is the spatial derivative of G. So this is a fairly explicit function. By the way, I should mention that I'm writing this functional not only uh, you know, as a sort of motivation, but also because we're actually going to recover exactly this kind of Berry phase later on in the quantum Hall effect. Now, before actually turning to that, we can start asking what's the analog of this, ent this entire construction for electrons in two dimensions, say in a plane, in a strong magnetic field. And so what I want to do now is to define an action of deformations on electronic wave functions in the plane. Again, before proceeding, let me ask if there are any questions. Please let there be questions. It's so nice when there are questions. If there are no questions, it's fine. I, I can also keep going. <laughs> okay, no questions. So let me proceed. Um, I, I do hope everything is clear though, really. Please do interrupt. So uh, what I have done so far was to talk about one dimensional deformation very phases. And now I want to go on, move on to higher dimensions, specifically to a plane. Now, in order to do this, there's a preliminary that I need to address. Namely, I need to tell you how area preserving deformations, these diffeos, act on one body wave functions in the plane. Now, specifically, I'm going to do this in two steps. First, I'm going to define area preserving diffeomorphisms carefully, just so, and I'm going to give you some examples, just again, so that we know what we're talking about. And then I'm going to introduce their unitary action on wave functions. So, to introduce diffeos, consider a plane where you put some vector potential A. I want to think of this potential as the vector potential for a magnetic field, but in the language of differential forms, this is really a one form, and the magnetic field is the exterior derivative of that guy. The advantage of thinking in these terms is that you can really think of the ma magnetic field in the plane as an area form, and then by definition, a diffeomorphism of the plane, so a smooth bijective deformation of the plane, it preserves the magnetic field if and only if it preserves area, which you can state in these terms uh, in terms of the pullback by, by the diffeomorphism. And then by definition, the group of special diffeomorphisms, area preserving diffeomorphisms of, or as diffeos of the plane, that's a group that I'm going to consider and they all satisfy this property here. Now, before going, so this is just the definition which I've now flashed, but before proceeding, let me give you an example again so that it becomes a bit more concrete. The example I'm going to give, I'm going to write in a polar coordinate. So I have a, ra a radius r and an angle phi. And the question I'm going to ask is the following. What is the most general Zdifo that I can perform in such a way that I deform the angle phi in a completely arbitrary manner? So in other words, suppose that you pick some one-dimensional diffeomorphism g. So you really think of phi as spanning a circle and you deform it in a certain way according to diffeomorphism g. Well, then what can you do to the radial coordinate in such a way that you preserve the local, local area form? Well, very clearly, if your area form is just dr squared wedge d phi, if you divide r squared by the derivative of g, this is clearly a deformation that preserves area. So this is one typical example 
of the DFAO. And in fact, they're quite important in the quantum Hall effect because uh, these transformations turn out to be, in fact, the conformal transformations of edge modes. So for this reason, I'm going to call them edge diffeomorphisms. Again, instead of writing things in terms of formulas, uh, you know, pictures help. So here's a picture of a bunch of points which I have distributed in the plane. And what I'm going to do is to act on those points with certain edge diffeos, just so that you see what's going to happen. So here's one example where, as you can see, I am again contracting. So what I'm doing here is essentially the analog of what, what I did earlier in one dimension. So here, for example, I'm pinching the angular circle in this direction so that I'm increasing the angular density in this direction here. But since I'm increasing the angular density, there's actually a decrease in radial density such that the density of points roughly remains the same throughout here. So that's really what's achieved by this radial term here on the left. And conversely here on the left of the, of the drawing, I have increased the angular density. As you can see, I, I have sort of expanded the circle, but this increase in, then in angular density is compensated by an increase in radial density. I, I hope I got the words right. I, I, I'm not sure if I got confused, but I think I got them right. So again, the intuition is clear. All you're doing is just deforming the circle and compensating whatever deformation of the circle you're doing by uh, suitable radial rescalings. Again, you can do anything you like as long as you're being smooth. So here's another example, which is perhaps a bit more interesting, where you're pinching the circle at, in three directions and thereby you know, increasing the radial density along these lines and sorry, increasing the radial density along these directions here and decreasing the radial density along these directions here. So again, those are the typical diffeos that they want to hit, keep in mind. And these specifically are actually edge diffeos. In particular, I should mention, in fact, that edge diffeos will eventually give rise to whole viscosity. So again, I'm showing them with a very specific purpose in mind. Now, what I've done so far was completely classical in the sense that I never talked about quantum mechanics. I just talked about the plane where I'm performing some deformations. But what I now want to do is to define a unitary action of these deformations on wave functions. So consider a wave function, which is square integrable in the plane. And let's ask how we can act unitarily on such wave functions with ZDFOs. So again, for every ZDFO G, I want to define a unitary operator U of G that acts on wave functions. Again, to tell you what this action is, I have to evaluate this at some point X on the plane. And the starting point is sort of obvious. You're going to do exactly what we did on the circle, meaning you're going to start by just shifting the argument of the wave function here on the right. This shift of argument simply means that if you have, say, a Gaussian wave function, which is centered somewhere on the plane, you're shifting its argument. If you, know, if you perform, say, a translation, well, clearly you have to move the position of the maximum of the wave function. That's just what this is achieving. And in fact, if our particle were neutral or if there were no ma magnetic field, that would be the end of the story. However, we emphatically want to consider charged states. And specifically, we want to consider Berry phases. Now, in order to do this, we have in mind that uh, we actually want to perform some interference experiments between wave functions. In other words, we want to compare wave functions, we want to compare their phases. But in order for this comparison to be meaningful, it is crucial that all wave functions be written in the same gauge. Now, these diffeos do preserve the magnetic field. So in other words, they preserve the exterior derivative of the gauge potential, but they generally do not preserve the gauge potential itself. And so in order to now preserve it, you have to combine what's written here on the right-hand side by what's going to be added here, a compensating gauge information on the left, which happens to be written, sorry, on well, on the left part of the right-hand side, anyway, you get it, uh, a compensating gauge information that turns out to take th this form. Now, you really don't need to understand the details of this formula, in particular, what I'm calling d to the minus one is essentially an inverse of the exterior derivative. This is a technical detail that doesn't matter. What does matter is that on the plane, for every SDFO, there always exists a way to compensate the change of gauge due to a SDFO by adding a compensating gauge transformation. Now, this formula in terms of unitary operators acting on wave functions is uh, fairly abstract. So let me actually show you the action of these deformations on the Hamiltonian, which is perhaps a bit more uh, intuitively clear. So let's assume that the one-body Hamiltonian is uh, a Landau term, so P minus A squared, that's a Landau Hamiltonian, the kinetic term, if you will, plus some potential V. And let's ask how we can act on that guy by sandwiching it between G and G inverse. 
Well, if you take this Hamiltonian and do the computation with this guy here, what you find is the GHG inverse takes the form written here. Now, there are two striking aspects about this formula. The first is that the potential V now has a shifted argument, which means that if, for example, uh, your Zdefeo maps circles on ellipses, and if it so happens that your potential had equipotentials that were circles, well, now these equipotentials are actually ellipses. That's the first change. And the second change, as you can see here, is that the metric, which was here just the Euclidean metric, is now some deformed metric due to this default. Of course, the curvature still vanishes, but it, it is some different metric due to this default. And so in other words, when you act with this default, you're actually on the one hand changing the metric of the system and you're also deforming its potential. So that's the kind of uh, parameter variations, if you will, that you should keep in mind. And in particular, it's manifest at this stage that parameter space is infinite dimensional. This set of Hamiltonians are labeled by G, by a point G in a group manifold. And it's very clear that this group manifold is infinite dimensional. So we have infinite, an infinite dimensional parameter space. And so what we're going to do next is to try to compute the Berry phases due to this parameter dependence. Before I do this, there's actually one preliminary that I need to mention. It's sort of a technical comment, but it's a technical comment that has very important implications for physics. The comment has to do with the composition of the fields. Indeed, uh, the formula that I wrote for these operators U of G uh, is manifestly unitary. It preserves scalar products. But you might ask, what happens if you try to compose to the fields? Indeed, is it true that uh, the operator implementing the composition of, say, F and G actually equals the composition of the individual unitary operators implementing F and G? If the answer were yes, we would say that this U is actually a representation of the group of diffos. However, when you do the computation, you actually find there's a non-zero extension appearing here on the right-hand side with a very specific cocycle C that happens to be given by this formula in blue. By the way, formulas in blue mean, they typically mean either literature or comments that you don't need to understand. So this is emphatically a comment that I'm displaying just, just for completeness, but it's not crucial that you follow what it means. Just know that it exists, you can compute it. What is crucial though, is that this means that the uh, operators U do not quite furnish a representation of the fields, but they actually furnish a project representation thereof with a non-zero central charge that happens to be a product of the electric charge and the magnetic field. So in particular, there's an example of this uh, with which at least the people familiar with the quantum Hall effect may be familiar. Um, if you apply this to translations, so first let's specify one thing. Of course, if you are performing translations, you are very much performing translations. Oh, someone is admitted now. OK, I just admitted someone in the room very late. OK, um, so of course, translations are ZDFOs. And in particular, you can compute this extension for translations. Uh, and it turns out that if you do this, you will find that the extension actually is proportional to the area enclosed by translation F followed by translation G followed by translation F inverse followed by G inverse. And again, if you are a bit experienced with the quantum hole effect, you may recognize this as something very standard. Namely, this is exactly what happens for magnetic translations. Indeed, magnetic translations are exactly those translations here with a non-zero extension. And so what we find is that we have just extended magnetic translations in a sort of sweeping general way. In particular, because the extension of a magnetic translations is a Heisenberg central extension, we now know that there is no way to absorb this extension C by some redefinition. In other words, there's no way, you know, you might have thought that just multiplying these operators U by some phase would remove the factor C. Well, that turns out not to be the case. There is no way to remove the factor C. And in particular, C really has physical effects. In fact, we're going to see eventually that it is really this cocycle C that will add an Aharonov bomb phase to the Berry phase. So it's very important, in fact, to keep it in mind. So this is all I had to say about unitary defaults acting on wave functions in the plane. What I'm now going to do is to move on to Berry phases. But before I do that, let me ask again, are there any questions? Silence means no questions. So if there are no questions, I'm just going to proceed. So. Uh, I'm now going to move on to the essentially the core of the talk, which is about Berry phases due to adiabatic defaults acting on droplets in the plane. And I'm going to do this in two steps. Mm 
first by uh, explaining what the Berry phases are at one body level. I'm just going to focus on one wave function, act on it with certain diffos, and read off the Berry phase. And then I'm going to move on to the many body setup. And by the way, I should stress that at this stage, when I say many body, um, I, I will simply mean that I'm putting a bunch of non interacting electrons together, which means that the one body case effectively gives you already gives you all the information you need. I am emphatically not going to consider interactions between electrons, which of course um, make the whole discussion much more complicated. And I'm only going to mention at the very, I'm only going to mention interactions uh, at the very end of the talk as an open problem effectively. So I'm going to focus here on non interacting many body systems. But first, let's start with the one body Berry phase. And let's make it even simpler than one body. Let me not assume only that it's a one body problem, but even let me assume that the wave function I want, well, the states I want to consider are neutral. They have zero charge, or equivalently, I've switched off the magnetic field. Then, as diffeos act on wave functions according to this simplified formula, so there's now no compensating gauge transformation on the right hand side. And of course, we can assume that we pick some energy eigenstate psi, we act on it with certain time dependence diffeos gt, and we can ask what's the ensuing Berry phase? Well, so let's address this question. The Berry phase is given again by the same formula written before. And again, you know the action of these operators on wave functions. You know that the scalar product of wave functions is an integral over the plane. So you can just compute this and find this sort of heavy expression written here. So let's now simplify this. I want to simplify this expression to show you that there's actually a very nice structure he hidden behind it. First, you may recognize the term psi star d psi here on the right as a part of this uh, probability current here. So if you integrate by parts here, you can actually rewrite this as a component of the current. That's the first thing. The second object that we need to simplify is this time derivative of the inverse of G evaluated at G. So now that's, that seems very complicated, but in fact, that's nothing but the logarithmic derivative of G. In other words, we can really write it as G inverse times G dot. And if you're familiar, for example, with gauge theory, this is really what you would normally encounter in that context. That's really how you can think of the whole, of the whole story. So uh, furthermore, this combination G inverse G dot is of course Lie algebra valued. It's, it's a combination of derivatives of G that happens to take values into Lie algebra. In the case at hand, the Lie algebra of course consists of vector fields because the group consists of diffeomorphisms. And so this pairing between the uh, current component I and the ith component of this log derivative can be written as a pairing between the one form of the current and the vector field of the log derivative. And at this stage, that's it. This is the simplest and most compact formula that you can get for the Berry phase due to adiabatic diffeos in a plane. Uh, in particular, we can now try to generalize this to charged states. Uh, indeed, for charged states, you would imagine that the same formula takes the holds because if you just set the electric charge to zero or the magnetic field to zero, this has to still be true, except of course that now the current needs to be gauge invariant. So what we're going to do is simply to replace the current J by its gauge invariant completion, where now all uh, covariant derivatives have now, be, oh, sorry, all usual derivatives have been replaced by covariant derivatives. And uh, you might think that this is the end in fact, because this expression now is very much gauge invariant. It's a perfectly compact expression for the Berry phase. And you can, of course, apply it to whatever case of interest you have. If you consider some state with some known current and some uh, diffeos with a known log logarithmic derivative, you can just compute this and find whatever you're interested in. However, this is crucially not the end of the story. And there is a very simple intuitive reason for this. Indeed, suppose that you have a wave function in the plane, which is, say, a Gaussian with zero current. So there is no current and the Berry phase vanishes. But now suppose that you take, well, sorry, there's no current and this term vanishes. But now suppose that you take that wave function and submit it, subject it, sorry, to uh, time dependent translation. So you move the wave function in the plane and you make it return to its initial location. As you do this, the wave function for sure is going to pick up an Aharonov bomb phase because along the path of that wave function, there's a non zero flux of the magnetic field, which you somehow have to take into account. And clearly, that's not taken into account in, in this charged formula. And so at the stage, at the level of this explanation I'm giving now, all you have to do is just to add an extra term to the Berry phase, namely this particular 
combination of the Aharonov bond phase. As you can see, this holonomer here is, of course, just an Aharonov bond phase, and it's weighted by the wave function here. So this is perfectly reasonable. And in fact, it turns out that this expression here is the complete formula for deformational berry phases due to DFOs in a plane. When I say it's the complete formula, I mean that I've presented here in this sort of heuristic manner where I've just tried to generalize in a, in a sort of intuitive way uh, what would happen, what happens for a neutral state. But you can actually show that this formula really is the same as the formula I wrote before for very phases of group representations, up to one caveat, which is that the representation here is actually projective. So you have to add an extra term here on the right hand side to actually obtain a full very phase. And so that's really the kind of very phase we're going to consider from now on. And again, let me ask, uh, is everything clear so far? I hope I hope people are following because this is in the sense, the key formula I'm going to use from now on. So if there's any complaint about this, any question, please go ahead and do ask, because I'm, you know, it's it's not quite standard. So if people have questions, you should complain. So yeah, yes, Oblaja. So in, in the blue formula that you showed, uh, what's the correspondence between the terms and the Berry phase? Does this the, the Haranov bomb phase is not the central term, or is it? Very good, very good. Very good question. Thanks. Uh, so Actually, this central extension here it turns out to contribute both the Aharonov bomb phase and the covariant derivative term of the current here. So it's really where the sort of the, the electric charge comes here, and it really comes in both terms. Uh, and actually, the reason I did not show this computation on the slide is because it's it's actually quite heavy. Uh, if you remember how this cycle was defined, it was a fairly complicated expression involving an inverse, actually a homotopy operator. So you you know. It actually took me took us a while to obtain this expression here, but in the end, that's just what it is. And in particular, the Aharonov bomb phase comes in part from this expression here. Thanks. Yes. Um, so uh, what I've done so far was presented for a one-body system, and so we're we now have this uh, sort of compact. Wait, there's there's a question in the chat. From Leo in the chat, yeah. Do you want to ask it maybe or just read it? Yeah, yeah. So I'm reading it. So the question is. Could you remind us how the current appears in the full formula for the very phase and what this term means as opposed to the Aharonov bomb phase? Uh, I'm, wait, I'm not sure I understand the question. Leo, do you want to jump in? I think you should be able to unmute yourself. I, I'm very willing to remind thing, people about things, but I don't know what what I have what I have to remind people of. Is, sorry, so it's the left part of uh, the equation for the Berry phase there. There is so the current J. So uh, how, how do you derive this thing as opposed to the more natural uh, Aharonov bomb phase uh, on the right hand side? Oh, 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 the derivation of the current. You mean in particular, how do these derivatives appear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. so they really appear in the same way as in the neutral case that I, consider, that I considered initially. So if you now, if you go back all the way to the start of the slide, I considered this unitary action on wave functions. And then I said, let's pick an energy eigenstate. We act on it with DFOs, and we have a Berry phase that's given by this expression here. So here, what I'm saying is I have a bundle, if you will, of eigenstates to the Hamiltonian, which happened to be an eigenstate psi acted upon by a unitary operator of some group element G. And so those are your parameter dependent eigenstates, if you will. And in order to compute the Berry phase, you compute the you know parameter. The, the typical formula for the Berry connection is a parameter dependent state, exterior derivative in parameter space, parameter dependent state. So that's really what I'm computing here. And it so happens that if you take this formula here and you compute what this gives, this time derivative acting on GT is going in particular to give rise to a spatial derivative of, of psi, because you're going to differentiate psi with respect to space, and then you're going to differentiate g bar with respect to time, whereupon you find this term here. And the derivative with respect to space of psi comes here. And then you just identify this guy with a component of the current. More precisely, you, you say that this term psi star d psi is equal to 1 half times itself plus 1 half times itself. And then in one of those one halves, you integrate by parts to obtain the second term, and you find this current here. That's really where the current comes from. And the, the same is true even in the charged case. In the charged case, this term is still there, regardless of the presence of this cycle and the charge and the compensating gauge transformation. This is still the case, and this is how you see the currents. 
Does this answer your question? Yes, I think so. Thanks. Okay, good. good. Thanks for the question. And please, again, do, do not hesitate to ask. So, yes, so you have the current because of this. You rewrite the log derivative in this neat way. You generalize to charge states by just making all these gauge invariants and adding an Aharonov bomb phase, and you get this expression for the Berry phase. And so now this is a, an explicit expression for a one body Berry phase, which we can immediately apply to many body states, at least many body states that consist of non interacting electrons. So I'm going to consider a droplet, if you will, of a very large number of electrons. I'm actually going to assume that these electrons are put in some confining potential, for example, so that they all have non-degenerate one-body energy. So in particular, the ground state of the system is actually a Slater determinant of some low-lying, of some states, of some one-body states with low energy. And so what's the Berry phase? Well, the one-body Berry phase was just given by this formula here. But now because the full state is actually a Slater determinant of many one-body states, the complete many body phase is just going to be a sum of many of n one body phases. So for example, this probability density of the wave function now becomes replaced by the numerical density of the droplet. And this probability current becomes the numerical current of the droplet. And that's it. That's literally how simple it is. You've, you now have an explicit formula for Berry phases of essentially any droplet. As long as you give me the density of the droplet, the current of the droplet, and a certain choice of these adiabatics defaults, you can, in principle, read off the corresponding many-body Berry phase. And so, in particular, if your droplet happens to be this disk here, and you happen to apply these deformations to it, you can, in principle, read off the Berry phase from this expression here. So what we're going to do in what follows is actually apply this formula to certain specific choices of defaults. Now, concretely, let's start with the simplest, perhaps the most trivial example of Zdiffios, just to make sure that what we're doing is consistent. Namely, suppose that you act on your droplet with certain translations. So you map every point x on itself plus some time-dependent vector, and the time-dependent vector emphatically doesn't depend on position. So I'm really translating the whole plane uniformly in a time-dependent manner. And furthermore, I'm going to assume that these, this path A of t is actually periodic. So it starts at some point and returns, it, returns to that same point eventually. So you plug these guys here, you compute these log derivatives, and you actually find that the current term vanishes. It's a total derivative. And only the density contributes. In fact, the density gives rise to this factor of n. And you find that the Berry phase is just n times an Aharonov bomb phase. So this makes perfect sense. We, we have now just recovered the fact that if we act on our droplet, we're indeed recovering n times the Aharonov bomb phase, which should indeed, indeed be the case. So what we're going to do next is to apply uh, this very general formula to somewhat more interesting examples of Zdiffios. Before I move on there, there's actually just one technical comment that I want to make, but it's a comment that you hear sometimes when giving this talk, especially to condensed matter physicists. Uh, you should know that here I'm working in the thermodynamic limit. And if I take the thermodynamic limit while assuming that uh, the droplets area remains finite, then, in fact, in that limit, the system becomes gapless. In fact, the sort of, you know, you, you, you have a certain number of filled states, you fill them, but in a sense, you flatten the spectrum so much that uh, the spectrum actually becomes continuous. You have a very definite ground state, but you need arbitrarily small energy to, energy to jump from the ground state to any other higher energies, energy many body state. And so you might worry that the adiabatic theorem does not apply because you no longer have a gap. Well, fortunately, there's actually a generalized adiabatic theorem due to Avron and Elgart, where they showed that the adiabatic theorem does apply even when there is no gap, at least provided you are on the boundary of the spectrum. And in this case, because we're actually looking at the ground state, we are by definition at the boundary of the spectrum. We are at the lowest point of the energy spectrum. And so the, the adiabatic theorem does apply. So it, it still makes sense to write Berry phases such as those. And so those are now the Berry phases that I'm going to apply to certain uh, interesting choices of Zdiffios. So there they are. Now, what Zdiffios do I actually want to consider? And what samples do I actually want to consider? Well, I'm going to focus, as advertised at the start of the talk, I'm going to focus on whole droplets, meaning that I want to assume, first for definiteness, I'm going to assume that the uh, confining potential is isotropic, so that the droplet genuinely takes the form of a, a disk. And what I'm going to do is to act on that disk and on, on the underlying potential with certain Zdiffios. Now, 
In that disk, I need to describe my many body state in terms of a density and a current. So let me introduce certain coordinates. First, I have the radius here, and it turns out that the density of the droplet now is purely a radial function. In fact, you can really think of the density as being constant and non-zero in the bulk. So it's constant, constant and non-zero here, and then it sort of sharply drops to zero at the edge of the droplet. So it's really a bulk quantity. And the second coordinate I'm going to use to describe the disk is this angle phi. And in terms of that angle, in fact, the current of the droplet turns out to be, well, purely angular. In other words, there is no radial current. There's nothing flowing here in the radial direction. Everything purely flows along the angle phi. And furthermore, the magnitude of the current is a purely radial function. In fact, you can think of this function j of r as being 0 in the bulk, 0, 0, 0, and then it jumps in a Gaussian fashion near the edge. So you should really think of it as being, well, an edge object. It's something that is 0 in the bulk, then jumps at the edge. So as you will see in what follows, there's going to be this sort of neat com complementarity between the bulk density rho and the edge current j. And so with this data, I can now in principle compute the very phase. For definiteness, I'm actually going to compute it in symmetric gauge because it's gauge invariant anyway. And since everything is isotropic, I'm going to choose the gauge that's consistent with isotropy, whereupon the very phase turns out to take this form here. Again, I stress that this is a very general expression for the very phase for n is diffeo. Notice in particular that here I've introduced uh, a length scale L, which is the magnetic length. If you don't know what it is, don't worry too much. It's just a, a convenient way to absorb the dependence on the electric charge and the magnetic field, which are hidden in this magnetic length. But if you just want to set it to one, feel free to do so. That's typically what you actually do in you know, well-chosen conventions. Now. OK, this formula is in principle explicit, but it's a bit unwieldy. So what we're going to do from now on is to actually apply it to specific choices of diffeos. Concretely, we're going to focus again on edge diffeos, which you may recall are arbitrary deformations of the angular coordinates, which are compensated by radial rescalings in such a way that these diffeos preserve the local area. So now suppose that I choose a time-dependent family of adiabatic edge diffeos. So I choose these time-dependent group element G to be all of which, to all of them be edge diffeos. And you know you can compute the standard derivative here, you can compute the log derivative here, you can compute the radial component here. You plug all these data here into the berry phase formula, and what you end up finding is this very simple expression for the berry phase. Now there's one striking aspect of this formula that I stressed already early on in the talk. Notice that here there is this uh, one-dimensional deformational berry phase that appears. So this is something I advertised early on by saying that we're eventually going to recover 1D deformational berry phases in the 2D quantum Hall effect. So this is already nice. The only difference, of course, is that the prefactor of that berry phase now is not just, well, in, if you can think of it really as a sort of angular momentum, but it's a complicated angular momentum that depends both on the edge current and on the bulk density. Now, it turns out that linear diffeos of the plane are, in fact, edge diffeos. By this, I mean that if you choose Cartesian coordinates x, y, and act on them with the matrix that has determinant 1, this guy, this deformation, can actually be written as an edge diffeo of a suitable form. And in particular, then this function g depends on these entries a, b, c, d. And so, in particular, you might hope, because whole viscosity is derived for linear diffeos of this form, you might hope that this very phase formula somehow reproduces whole viscosity. And so that question, how to reproduce whole viscosity, is going to be the last thing I want to address in the talk. Again, let me ask if there are no questions, if there are questions. If, there are, if it's silent, it means no questions, so let me proceed. OK. So uh, we now have a formula for very phases that, first, we have a very general formula. But here I've actually written down a formula specific to edge diffeos. And so what I'm now going to do is apply this very phase formula to linear diffeos, to transformations of this form. Specifically, I want to talk about whole viscosity. Now, to actually to do this, I'm first going to remind you what whole viscosity is in the first place, because I'm not going to assume that everyone knows what it is. And then I'm actually going to compare what I will say about whole viscosity to our stiff very phases. So to introduce whole viscosity in the way it is normally presented, you have to consider the quantum Hall effect on a torus. So I want to think of the torus as a quotient of the plane, 
in other words, a rectangle, if you will, where you identify opposite sides of the rectangle. And I'm going to put some electrons there. And then I'm going to linearly deform the torus, meaning that I'm going to map X and Y on some uh, matrix acting on X and Y in such a way that they preserve the area of the torus. So for example, I would deform my torus into this new shape here. And as I do this, of course, my system is going to react to the deformation in a certain way. Now, there's sort of an alternative perspective about this, where you can say that you're not actually deforming the torus, but you are, it's, I guess it's an active versus passive point of view. You're not deforming the torus, it remains the same rectangle as before, but you're not deforming the metric. And if you deform the metric, of course, you're going to deform the Hamiltonian. In fact, you're deforming the kinetic term of the Hamiltonian. Indeed, it turns out that if your Hamiltonian was the usual Landau Hamiltonian, P minus A squared, and then, in fact, it turns out that the deformed Hamiltonian takes the form between here, again involving this sort of non-Euclidean metric due to this linear SDFO that has deformed the plane. Crucially, I'm writing this Hamiltonian in the form of a unitary operator. Well, it's sandwiched between a unitary operator and its inverse. And so this is indeed quite similar to what we had before, except now that I have to tell you what this unitary operator is. It is not, in fact, the unitary operator I defined earlier on when acting with diffuse. Instead, I'm going to now explain how you can think of this unitary operator as follows. Instead, you can write the Hamiltonian here as a quadratic combination of what are called mechanical momenta. If you don't know what they are, let me just tell you that essentially you can think of the quantum Hall effect as a harmonic oscillator, really, at least at the one body level. The Landau Hamiltonian is sort of like a very degenerate harmonic oscillator Hamiltonian. And then there are these ladder operators A that sort of, you know, A dagger increases energy, A decreases energy, and they make you travel between different Landau levels. And in terms of these guys, which are in fact mechanical momenta, you find that these unitary operators are some exponentials of quadratic combinations of mechanical momenta. In fact, these exponentials furnish a unitary representation of the SL2R group. And it makes sense that it's SL2R, given that we have linear diffos, so we're really acting with SL2R matrices on the plane. And in particular, you can now suppose that you fill a certain number new of Landau levels. So, you know, you take, you take your torus, you put a bunch of electrons there, and you assume that new Landau levels, new successive energy levels of this Hamiltonian are completely filled, because they're quite completely degenerate. And then you ask, what's the resulting Berry phase in the thermodynamic limit? Well, what you find is that the Berry phase is n nu times a hyperbolic area. Now, I really want to go step by step through the three terms of this formula because our whole point is going to be to try to reproduce this from Zdiffo's. So the Berry phase is extensive, it's proportional to the number n of electrons, it is proportional to the number nu of field levels, and it involves a hyperbolic area form in a parameter space that has to do with the SL2R group. So this hyperbolic area form really comes from the SL2R geometry. So the question is now, can we reproduce this Berry phase formula with Zdiffo's in a plane? That's really the, the question they want to address. And to address it, I'm going to focus once more on the Berry phase due to edge diffos. Recall that Berry phases of that form uh, are written like this. So they're one dimensional Berry phases multiplied by this coefficient, which happens to be some integral of the current and the density. And again, recall that the current is sort of concentrated on the edge why the density is concentrated in the bulk. So again, I'm going to assume that I'm filling a certain number of Landau levels. Now here, when I say I'm filling them, I actually mean that there is, you know, uh, I'm occupying them partly all the way up to some Fermi energy. And then at that Fermi energy, I just, end, I just stop filling them because I emphatically want to have an edge. So I'm filling partly a certain number new of Landau levels with n electrons. And I'm going to ask, what's the value of these two coefficients here in the thermodynamic limit? It turns out that the first coefficient is extensive. It's proportional to n. And in fact, it's n times nu times the number of field levels. But the second coefficient here involving the density is actually super extensive. It's proportional to n squared. And this, in fact, makes perfect sense because this term turns out to be the total angular momentum of the droplet, which should indeed square, uh, scale as n squared. However, there's now a problem because our goal was to compare this Berry phase to whole viscosity, but we have just found that we have a super extensive Berry phase in the thermodynamic, thermodynamic limit to be contrasted with what I explained earlier is an extensive whole viscosity. 
This is clearly not the same, so this is clearly a problem. So what I'm going to do is to suggest a way out first as a sort of recipe, and then on the next slide, which is sort of this dot here, on that slide, I'm actually going to justify why this is a sensible thing to do. But, but for now, let's just assume that we can do the following. Recall that the Berry phase is a sum of two terms, each of which is separately gauge invariant. The current term is gauge invariant because the current is gauge invariant, and the density term is gauge invariant because it's actually on a Halonov-Bohm phase. So suppose that we now focus only on the extensive term and just declare that we remove the Aharonov-Bohm phase. So from now on, I'm going to declare that the Berry minus Aharonov-Bohm phase is n times nu minus times this integral here. Now that already looks reassuring because it's n times nu times something that only depends on the group elements I consider. So it's very close to what actually happens in whole viscosity. And indeed, if you now focus on linear DFOs, which happen to take this form here, so I'm choosing to parameterize them by some real parameter lambda and an angle theta, where you can think of theta as a rotation parameter, and lambda is a parameter that tells you that if you have a plane in Cartesian coordinates, you're sort of squeezing them in this way. If I take those linear DFOs, then it turns out that the curvature of this very, well, the, uh, the curvature associated with these very phases minus the Aharonov bomb curvature is actually n times nu times this particular uh, two form in parameter space. Let me repeat this it's extensive n, it's proportional to the number nu of field levels, and it involves this hyperbolic area form. In fact, if you go through the details of the computation all the way into you know, including all numerical coefficients and really making sure that all co conventions match, you can actually verify that this expression for the curvature matches on the nose what is normally called whole viscosity. So in other words, we have managed to reproduce from this Berry phase, at least by removing a gauge invariant but super extensive contribution, we have managed to reproduce whole viscosity. However, at this stage, as I announced, this really just looks like a recipe. I just chose to remove an aharonov bomb phase without any justification, and it seems to work, but so why does it work? And so addressing this question is the last thing I want to do. I hope I'm okay with time. I started at two, but there was a delay. Yeah, okay. So I guess I have like two more minutes, five more minutes. Yes, five. Five, five, amazing. Five is good, five, five is enough. So uh, I want to explain why this, you know, ad hoc recipe actually reproduces whole viscosity. And to do this, I'm going to ask what happens if you were to take a small linear SD by, by this, I mean a small matrix action of this form labeled by a complex parameter epsilon and the real parameter omega. When I say what happens to droplet, I really mean how would you implement this operator in terms of the unitary operators I defined earlier on uh, in section, I guess, section two of the talk. So, in order to explain what this would do, well, I have to introduce some terminology. I've already introduced mechanical momenta, which you know, which are ladder operators for Lando levels. And then the other operators I haven't yet talked about yet are magnetic translations, BB dagger, which are sort of orthogonal to uh, mechanical momenta and which, which uh, change the angular momentum of states. Now, in terms of these operators, the operator implementing a small linear SDFO happens to be given by this combination here. And when I say, it happens to be given by, what I mean really is that if you go back to the definition I gave earlier for these unitary operators u, and you apply this definition to a linear SDFO of this form, what you find is that this operator is the identity plus i times this Hermitian guy here. Now, what's striking about the Hermitian guy is that it has a factorized dependence, dep dependence on a's and b's. There's first this term that only depends on B's, which is sort of the lowest and the level projection of the operator. And then there's this term here, which is the only one responsible for changing the metric. Did recall that the Landau Hamiltonian commutes with these guys here. And so what does this have to do with whole viscosity? Well, the point is that when you compute whole viscosity, you apply an action of linear diffuse where you only consider the A piece. You only consider A operators. You do not even include the B's. You may recall, as I mentioned earlier, that whole viscosity is given by an exponential of a squared. So that's what we're seeing here. But our computation emphatically takes into account also these b operators. So if you want to recover whole viscosity from our computation, you really have to do our computation and then remove the contribution of b's. 
And it turns out that that actually amounts to removing the aharonovum phase. That's why you have to remove the aharonovum phase. And that's why ultimately you get the same result regardless of how you do the computation, except that the computations are on the face of it very different. So in other words, this really explains why if you leave only the current term, you actually obtain whole viscosity. And I stress that the current is an edge object. So in a sense, we have reproduced whole viscosity from a pure edge computation. And so that's really all I wanted to say, uh, at least in the core of the talk. Let me, let me just briefly conclude. And to conclude, I'm going to do two things, summarize the talk and mention follow-ups. So the summary is the following. I argued that arbitrary area preserving deformations of whole droplets give rise to certain berry phases. And I argued that these berry phases actually generalize whole viscosity in a way that crucially involves the current of edge modes. Specifically, I did this by using certain unitary diffeos which, by the way, I presented as if, well, maybe, you know, I, I gave the wrong impression. It, it, in my talk, it was sort of almost, I, was, I wasn't claiming that we invented them, and indeed we did not, because in geometric quantization, these guys are known as quantum morphisms. So if, you, if in a sense, what they computed are very phases of quantum morphisms in the quantum hole effect. So that was the talk. Follow-ups are uh, plentiful, and those are things I hope to address in the coming months and years. Uh, the first thing is that I talked about the very specific symmetric setup, and it would be nice to show that the whole thing is independent of the potential, and perhaps even that you can put some random disordered potential and still get the same expression, for example, for whole viscosity. A second question is that you can, of course, project everything to the lowest and low level, and perhaps even see the contribution of edge modes with the central charge of edge modes. This is an open question. Of course, the elephant in the room is the generalization to uh, interacting states, and in particular to the fractional quantum hole effect. So there I have, at, the, at this stage, no clue how to do it, but we hope to look into that. And finally, I should mention that uh, you can really think of edge modes, which propagates on the boundary of the droplet, as, in a sense, time-dependent as diffeos as well. And you might hope that these guys produce certain very phases. In particular, if they're nonlinear edge modes, you can take them to be solitons, for example, and then you're producing certain you know, adiabatic deformations, which give rise to edge modes, as in hydrodynamics. And so this would be, uh, I think, an interesting observable to, to consider. So yes, I, I guess my time is up, and it makes sense. I hope to have managed to uh, you know, convey my enthusiasm for these questions and that, that, that the talk was interesting. So thanks a bunch for, for your attention. Thanks. A lot okay. and um, yes, we have time for a few more questions, I guess. I'm sure there are plenty of questions. If not, I have a few. Okay, good. Well, I have one. Uh, hello, thanks for the nice talk. Uh, my question is regarding this whole uh, setup of whole viscosity. Uh -huh. Because whole viscosity, in some sense, and uh, in condensed matter physics, and in relation with higher energy physics, is often related to some uh, anomalies of uh, of the action, yeah. and using yeah. large diffeomorphism anomalies and stuff like that. Uh, do you think your the setup you use there can uh, make the relation between these anomalies? And the and this whole viscosity. You mean can I apply a similar setup to? So you're asking if I can address the same question that I addressed here, from a perspective of effective quantum field theory, where whole viscosity is included as, as an extra term in the effective action. Is that what you mean? Yes, exactly. Because whole viscosity is often seen just as a consequence of a quantum anomalies. So sure, sure. Is it clear so, here with this derivation or not? In fact, so so this I guess goes towards generalizing the discussion to fractional quantum hole states because for fractional quantum hole states you would have you know in a sense you wouldn't have the luxury of using the microscopic derivation that I just showed and you would have to use. Uh, trial wave functions or conform and conformal blocks and effective field theory. So it's to me, it's an open question. I know that there is a paper by, I think it's Reed and Rezai, where they discuss very much an analog of what they talked about here from the perspective of uh, 
conformal blocks in CFT. Um, and and I, it's actually a paper on my reading list. So I, I, have, to, I have to add it to, you know, before, you, before even submitting this, I really have to read it. Um, I don't think they do things from the language of effective field theory. So I'm not sure how you would phrase the whole thing in terms of effective field theory. It's a, it's a good question. I really don't know. Uh, the fact is that here, this is, in a sense, this is a microscopic derivation of the coefficient of whole viscosity itself. In effective field theory, as far as I know, you would actually add this by hand as a coefficient. So I'm not sure how you would actually derive it microscopically from that perspective. So in a sense, good question. Like the, my short answer is good question. I have no clue. Thanks a lot. There's actually a question on the chat. I don't know if people are raising their hands, but there's actually a question on the chat. Yes. Uh, and it's okay. So let me just read the question. So uh, there's a bunch of questions. First, can you enlighten us on whole velocity? Uh, I think you can unmute yourself, Pascal. In principle, you should be. That's me. Yes. Look. Hi. I'm the one who asked the questions. Hi. Hi. Hello. You. So take your time. Yeah. It's uh, it's basically. Uh, uh, a set of questions, but they are related to more or less the same question. Okay, so first, when you say whole velocity, what? Uh, so this viscosity, it's my, uh, it's the corrector that changed it probably. Okay, so yeah, it's uh, the whole viscosity. Okay, so in the way I've presented it here, a whole viscosity is purely a, it's literally a Berry curvature. In fact, more precisely, it's a density of Berry curvature associated with linear SD fields. That's the sort of the most abstract definition I can give of it. And indeed, it, this definition doesn't carry any, I mean, it's very hard to connect that to physical intuition. Yeah, but I that, guess that if it has this name, it, uh, it means that some people, at least somewhere in some times, manage to relate it to, to, to the concept of viscosity. So. Exactly, exactly. So even, in fact, if you read the initial paper by, paper by Avron and company, uh, on whole viscosity, they derive whole viscosity from a perspective really of, um, I mean, they get to this formula as a very curvature by starting from a motivation that really comes from hydrodynamics. In hydrodynamics, what you would normally call viscosity coefficients in general is, uh, well, the coefficients that tell you how a stress tensor reacts to deformations. So mm -hmm. you take the stress tensor of a system, you apply certain deformations, certain deformorphisms, and you read off certain coefficients in, in an expansion of the response of the stress tensor to these deformations. So at linear mm -hmm. order, you would find typically viscosity, various notions of viscosity. Um, and in fact, you can show, even if in Avron's initial paper, so it's Avron, Zeller, and Zograff, Mm -hmm. uh, in their paper, they really start from that, and in a few lines, they get from there to a formula in terms of a very curvature, because they just say that in the quantum theory, you sort of have to replace these uh, variations of the stress tensor by quantum averages. And then effectively, when you compute the quantum average of the variation of a stress tensor with respect to changes of the metric, one of the contributions that you find is, in fact, a very curvature of the, of the state you're considering with respect to variations of the metric. Uh -huh. So this that's really, so, so, so there really is a sense in which whole viscosity as defined as a very curvature is the same thing as what you normally call viscosity in fluid me mechanics, except for one little bit of uh, sort of translation, which is that you have added quantum mechanics into the mix. You've said now I'm in quantum mechanics. And so if I want to compute variations of the stress tensor, I actually have to take expectation values. So it's related to some dissipative properties of the grand Tomol droplet. Okay, so uh, not a question. It's a question. So no, no, no. Sure. So the um, whole viscosity specifically happens to be a non-dissipative coefficient. And now, whether it's dissipative or non-dissipative depends on whether effectively depends on whether the components you're looking are diagonal or non-diagonal. So you mm -hmm. compute variation of the stress center ij with respect to uh, delta xk. That well. Delta Xi K, Delta Xi L, where Xi K and Xi L are components of the vector field of the deformation you're performing. And so that has four indices. And now you have to be careful whether these indices, you know, if K and L are 
coincide with i and j, you are performing, you're computing dissipative changes. But if they're in the sense orthogonal, then uh, you're actually computing non-dissipative changes. And it so happens that in two dimensions, there's a non-dissipative contribution. Oh. I should mention this is something I know. Uh, so I've even had discussions with colleagues on on who are sort of like with my professor in hydrodynamics. I actually talked to him about this. And he was a bit puzzled by the Avron paper. Like he, he knew how you do this in hydrodynamics, but then he looked at the Avron paper and he he didn't really recognize the language. But I really think it's just a matter of language at the end of the day. Um, oh. And how would you measure it? Or uh, does it has a, that's the second part of my question. How do we measure this? And how is it connected in some way to the electrical transport properties uh, in a quantum knowledge sample or not? Okay. Okay. So the how you would measure it, uh, so there's two levels to the question. At the level of the actual experiment, of actually carrying out an experiment, I think there's only one paper that actually, and it's a recent one. I wonder if it's even a nature or science paper. It may be a very sort of, in a very good journal. Uh, there's one paper that claimed to have measured the notion of odd viscosity, at least. Maybe not whole viscosity, but odd viscosity. Um, and there, it's really not clear to me what they do. But at the level of Gedanken experiments in sort of in more phenomenological terms, there is a beautiful paper by, Av by Avron called, I, th I think it just called Odd Viscosity. And I think it's from the 90s, um, where it's on the archive, you can find it. And he talks about what happens when you take a droplet with odd viscosity and how it reacts. So for example, um, what it means is that if you take, a, you know, viscosity normally means that there's going to be some, uh, the system is going to not like you trying to deform it. It's going to react to it in a certain way. And what Avron shows is that if you take, if you take a disc, I, I'll take a look, let me just show with my fingers. So if you take a disc and you sort of try to contract it, mm -hmm. if there is whole, so you really push on the disc, if there is whole viscosity, what the disc is going to do is to actually rotate. So it sort of goes along the, the same intuition as, uh, well, pretty much whole conductance. The fact that if you put a, you know, a potential or much more simply the skipping motion of electrons, if you put a current, so if you put an electric field in this direction, electrons go this way. So here it's sort of the same. You're trying to contract the disc, but then the disc sort of tends to rotate. That's the, this, uh, I guess, the most standard way to present odd viscosity. And I, I presume, I presume, have you had talks by Clément Aubert? Not yet. I've not on that, at least. I have, I have heard him many times, but not on this. Okay, because they have, so he, he's worked with, uh, with Pierre Antoine on uh, this, this notion of, uh, I guess, topological invariance for equatorial waves. And they have a, regularization prescription that relies on the notion of odd viscosity, which is sort of the odd viscosity is a more general term for whole viscosity. Whole viscosity is one particular class of odd viscosity. Mm -hmm. And uh, one apparently one question he has frequently, frequently when he talks to people, at least this is what he told me, when he talks to people in um, hydrodynamics is people asking him whether there exists a notion of odd viscosity in the ocean. And so the answer I think is not known. Um, I've been, when I was at a conference in July, last July, people who work on odd viscosity were saying, yeah, but if you have, if you have a fluid with broken time reversal invariance, for sure, there's going to be odd viscosity, but they have yet to be convinced. I'm, I'm not completely convinced that's so simple. So how would you measure it? I, I don't dare to say too much. What I can say is that there's a paper and then there is a paper by Avron where he explains, okay, Antoine, okay, thanks, thanks Antoine. Um, uh, there's a paper by Avron that explains, at least as a Gedanken experiment, what, what you might expect. Mm -hmm. And then regarding your last question, if there's any relation between this very phase and the properties of electric transport uh, in the quantum hole edge channel, I really don't know. And I'd be really interested to know this. So the thing, uh, so, okay, on the face of it, the, so mm -hmm. the transport, at least, okay, let's talk about the integer quantum hole effect. The transport properties of the edge channel are going to be specified by the number of field levels, uh, i.e. by the edge central charge, if you will. The central charge of edge modes tells you how many edge modes you have. It counts how many edge channels you have. And so that's going to tell you 
how you transport things along the edge. In DC, principle. stationary, yes. Sorry? In, uh, in DC, yes, in the, in the directed current regime, when the, right. the voltage yeah. are time independent, that's true. The problem right. is when you start to deform with time, it's a bit more complicated. Yes, probably, probably, probably. But here, uh, even, even at the level of sort of abstract questions, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, like without even thinking in terms of, you know, how we do it operationally in a lab, um, I've had, I mean, there seems to be coincidences, right? That the number of field levels is the central charge, but it's also in a sense, the coefficient of whole viscosity. So are the two related? I don't know. I've seen at least one paper that has these keywords in the title, uh, edge central charge from odd viscosity, and somehow they relate it. They relate mm -hmm. it. But I, it was a paper using explicitly effective field theory. And so again, it wasn't, you know, I come, you know, I'm new to the Van Hall effect, but at least the people with whom I, I have collaborated so far have all had this point of view that they are trying to do things as microscopically as possible. And then you sort of try to prove things, for example, in the integer quantum Hall effect where everything is explicit. You can compute it in quantum mechanics. Whatever you want to compute, you have it. And so it would be nice to prove based on some general principles, that there's a relation between the number of edge modes and whole viscosity, but I have no clue how to do this. And if there is a relation, then you would have a relation, at least in terms of numbers, between the numbers that uh, specify whole viscosity and the numbers that specify edge current. Uh -huh. Okay, yeah. Well, okay, so well, thanks for the, for the elements. Uh, it's convinced me to have a look at these papers at least. <laughs> but the, the, yeah, the, the, the thing is that uh, in, uh, even in the integer quantum Hall effect, the, the, what we know from the experiments is that the situation is complicated by Coulomb interactions already, in fact. So when you do a real experiment of transport, uh, uh, well, in the DC regime, it's not that Okay, it's fine, but in the AC, that means when you deform, well, it amounts to this, deforming as a function of time, yes. uh, then the situation can be uh, more complicated because there are, uh, uh, of course, the effect of Coulomb interactions that come into the play, the fact that the, the, the droplet, the approximate, enfin, the, the, the vision of a droplet, which is incompressible, is valid in some cases, but there are experimental situations in which it's not because at the edge, because of the of the smooth potential, confining potential, the things rearrange and lead to compressible stripes and so on and so forth. So the whole thing is, is, is quite complicated from a microscopic point of view. And what we know is that if you do an experiment, usually there will be, a, so even if in the, in the DC regime, the, 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 the system does not exhibit any, uh, any dissipation, there is no backscattering, everything is fine. But uh, when you do things in AC, things start becoming dif different. There are energy losses, for example, which are, uh, as of now, not completely understood. Uh, so it's not, um, there, there is a substrate, which is really the, the, the geometric and topological properties. But on top of that, in the experiments, come some the extra dynamical properties in which the Coulomb interaction play a role. So it's difficult to see how exactly one can disentangle the two well. I, think I, have, I have two questions to sort of jump back on what you said. Have you looked at these papers on quantized decreism? On quantized what? Decreism. No. In French. So there are papers. I know this because uh, I, I collab one of my collaborators is Nathan Goldman, and he mm -hmm. has papers on quantized decreism in cold atoms. So the intuition is very simple. You have a plane and you, you send on that plane a circularly po polarized uh, electromagnetic wave. Mm -hmm. There's ought to be a difference between in the response that you get between uh, uh, um, sort of left polarization and right polarization, mm -hmm. uh, which you would expect, of course, because everything is chiral in in a, in, in a you know a churn insulator, so you would expect this. But this sounds like the you know what they find is that as a result of this there is a decay rate, which sounds like it perhaps might be related to what you're talking about in AC in the AC setup, at least uh, to some extent. The, the, the effects on which I am, uh, I am alluding to are really things which are related to Coulomb interactions, I think. Uh -huh. So I'm not completely I, I sure presume, that- I presume uh, you have references in mind. 
Yes, yes, of course, things. People have studied that for a long time. They, they were paper. Um, it's, it's a bit complicated, the literature. They were paper by Aliner and Glassman. Or, uh, and then there was a beautiful paper by, um, what's his name? Han and Taules. So Han was the guy who was a postdoc, and Taules is David Taules, who studied the dynamics of a quantum uh, all uh, droplet, which is partly incompressible, but then has a stripe, a compressible stripe uh, before the density goes to zero. And, uh, and that thing has many modes and uh, exhibits some dissipative properties, in fact. And that was quite interesting. It was also, and they showed that more or less it reproduces the, uh, more or less, um, up to few details, it reproduces the, uh, the analysis of Aliner and Glassman. Uh, so that thing was already interesting. Uh, now, that's theory work. On the experimental side, there has been a lot of experiments done recently on AC transport and quantum OLED channel. And all of them, really all of them, uh, so AC experiment, but as well as experiments related to the coherence of single electron, they show that part of the energy is flowing away, probably in the bulk, and it's not completely understood why. Okay. Uh, so, well, but, and that's clearly, well, what people think is that it's clearly uh, the, the, the charge density fluctuation at the edge, which carry the edge current, they manage to get transported inside the bulk by, because they are charged, well, that's a hand-waving explanation, but people think that they are, they are, uh, they are charged puddle or small droplets, if you want, inside, where the, the, if the potential depletes the electron gas at some point, and that this can take energy by capacitive coupling, can take energy away. But you know, the, 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 the thing is not so clear because the, the, the people who do the experiment, they are not able to do uh, hundreds of samples, so it's yeah. difficult to have an experimental characterization that enables you to really corner the effect uh, by eliminating uh, some possibilities. So there is, a, there is a, even in the integer quantum all effect, I'm not speaking about anything fractional, nothing complicated. So it's a, it's a, it's a real issue there, yeah. But, uh, well, that's... Uh, okay, good, thanks. I've, I've learned lots of stuff. I, I didn't know most of it. Uh, uh, thanks for the question. Was, yeah, uh, but I did not know about all viscosity, so I will have a look on my side. <laughs> thanks a lot okay. for the, the I'm seminar. glad to, to have motivated you. Cool, thanks. Thanks. Okay. All right. Thanks. Uh, well, there are still a few people left. If you really have a question, we can we can take it. Uh, thanks. All right, if not, uh, well, thanks again. And uh, Please, I'm writing a message in the chat. <laughs> okay, good. <laughs> yes. I may understand it. Good. Now, now I'm satisfied. Ne next time. Thanks, Mark, for, for sending.